So I think that pretty much wraps it up for the major stuff. I'm sure there's a thousand things I'm forgetting uh, that I'm going to kick myself for when we stop rolling, but that pretty much covers the, the, the large stuff. So I hope that gives you a better overview of what, what it takes, what it takes to have a build at this level. Drive C. <laughs> Subscribe. <laughs>sitting here with uh, one of our projects. It's a 1934 Ford Victoria owned by Tim Allen. I am not selling a hot rod. Oh, oh, oh. This project came to us because it was a very long build. Um, it had some electric components and motors in it before. And when we took over the project, a lot of that stuff was pretty antiquated and really tough to work out. They were having all sorts of problems with basically getting everything to work. So um, they asked us to come in, take a look at it, and we decided to take a different route with the car, put one of our motors in it to make it a lot easier to install and run. Also give them more horsepower and reliability. Like any project, there's scope creep and it grows. When I first looked at the car, it had batteries in it. Most of the high voltages run through the vehicle and I said, oh good, we could kind of use this stuff and, and uh, segue onto our systems. Uh, unfortunately, once we got the car here and tore it apart, we found a lot of issues with some of the way the batteries were, were laid out in the car and uh, some of the structural integrity. And that's no fault of anybody's. It just, as projects come in, things have to be addressed and fixed. So basically we took this car from tip to tail and rebuilt everything when it comes to drivetrain. So it has one of our motors in it, contactor boxes, high voltage lines, cooling for the drive unit, cooling for the batteries, cooling for the charger. And uh, here we are with basically a finished product. We're about to deliver it back to Tim. We're doing some final touches here this week, tying up some wires, making sure everything works correctly, um, double checking all the flash and programming, and we're gonna go ahead and kick it off. But let's take a look at the whole entire build and what we had to do to get this vehicle up and running. So basically everything kind of revolves around our motor system. Uh, so we do have to get plumbing in this car, high voltage to the motor, also, all our communication, there's over five CAN networks inside this entire vehicle. To get this motor in the car too, it needed to be fabricated. This doesn't just simply drop into a 30 for Ford Victoria. A really good friend over at ABS Fabrication, Albert Shave, built us these really nice motor mounts and a whole entire cradle in the back to hold this motor up. What he did too, I thought was pretty impressive is Al's an artist and every fabricator has their own kind of style of doing things. Bodhi did a really nice job working on this car. So what Al did is he tried to match what Bodhi did. Therefore, it's seamless. If you look at the motor mounts versus what, what Bodhi did for the upper control arms and the lowers, it looks like it was made by the same guy. And that's the beauty of working with professionals like Al is he, he could look at a car and go, let's match what's already there so it doesn't stick out like a sore thumb. So beautiful job by Al. Also, kind of a first time for us as we painted this motor. Um, we felt that since this motor sits out pretty far forward on this car, this is a Ford Victoria from 1934. They do have side panels on the engine bay, so you could see the side of the motors pretty easily on these vehicles when you open them up. We wanted to showcase that by sliding the motor forward and displaying the whole entire drive unit. And uh, our really good buddy, Pete Hot Dog from Hot Dog Customs, hand painting this actual motor. It's pinstriped, it's gorgeous, same color as the wheels, so the whole car kind of flows together. Uh, once again, it's not about functionality, or not just about functionality, but about, you know, this has to look beautiful as well. And that's kind of where we come into the pictures. We do have a very pretty motor and we would like to display that. A lot of EVs are very boring. This one won't be. You pull the hood up on this at a car show, I guarantee a lot of people could flock to it. So we got a lot of thermal management in this vehicle and we'll dive into that here in the back. All right, so basically once we implement any part of this car, we do like to test everything, uh, especially now since the car is pretty much ready to be delivered to the client. Um, we've gone through every single piece of this, high voltage, low voltage, uh, thermal management. Actually, what I'm doing right now is testing the thermal management. We just plumbed this entire car. Uh, the batteries are scattered throughout the entire vehicle from the front of the car all the way to the back. We have cooling lines running everywhere as well to manage that temperature. Uh, one of the things that I use is AEM Cal through AEM. They, we use our VCUs to kind of monitor everything and control everything in the car. And if I plug in AEM Cal, I set up my own user interface here to kind of see what the vehicle is doing. Um, I know I'm a geek, but I like visual stuff too. So I put in dials, uh, graphs, I do needles as well. 
So at a glance, even when I'm working on the front of the car, I can kind of look back at the laptop and see if that, there's anything in the red versus having to go through and go, oh, what does that say? So I like the big visual aesthetics of this. Um, also, what we did with the battery is kind of unique in this situation. We, uh, we plumbed the whole entire car, ran the pumps, and I want to make sure it's going to cool every module correctly. There's 16 Tesla modules in this car. And as I said, they're everywhere. So there might be a high spot, a low spot. So what we did is we actually applied heat to the front radiator that cools the battery system and came back here and kind of watched the temperatures rise. So it's pretty cold right now. Um, it's not exactly summer here in California. I know I'm wearing some short sleeves, but the battery was, was sitting around 16 degrees Celsius this morning when I got in. We're gonna put a heat gun on it, run some heat throughout the system, have the pumps run, and we're gonna watch all 16 of those modules come up together. If I have one that's staying low, that means I have cooling issues, I have flow issues, or some air, or air got in the pocket or, or clogged up the line somewhere. So by doing this, we are not, no longer just making sure that, oh yeah, the pumps run, but we're making sure that thermal management is running the way it should, and there's no hot spots or cold spots in the batteries and everything is coming up together. Let's take a look at how we did that. It's kind of crude, but it works. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna warm up the battery cooling system just a little bit. I do have a heat gun, I'm gonna turn it down to a very low setting so we don't cook anything. Um, basically what I'm doing is blowing this onto the radiator that uh, pumps the fluid throughout the entire cooling system of the battery pack. I wanna make sure that the temperature comes up evenly throughout all 16 modules in this car. Once again, we're double checking to make sure our plumbing is working correctly. Uh, we already checked it for leaks. We ran the system for a few days to make sure nothing's clogged, everything's purged properly. And now we're gonna heat test it to make sure that it's cooling and heating properly to the entire system. So I'm gonna go ahead and apply some heat here. Hey Will, do you mind turning that fan on? So right now I'm just adding some heat over the cooling fan to the radiator that chills the batteries. In this case, we're warming them up because it's cold out today, and we're gonna hopefully see all the temperatures come up correctly on the computer screen. Let's check it out. So we just uh, turned on some heat for the pumps and the uh, thermal management system for the batteries. I'm looking at my computer right now to make sure that all 16 modules are actually coming up in temperature evenly. Uh, we started at 16 degrees Celsius before we ran this test. Now I can see they're all 17. A couple of them are starting to jump up to 18 degrees Celsius. So what that's showing me right now is everything is coming up gradually together. I don't have one or two or three of them kind of sitting back at 16 degrees and it's only been on for a few minutes. Uh, once again, this is just proving that our cooling system and thermal management system is working correctly. So not only do we test flow, we also to make sure that it actually is extracting and transferring heat correctly by running these kind of crude type of situations. Um, it's nice to know that these vehicles are gonna work correctly and software like this helps us monitor. Also, it could put this into a graph and chart everything and see if there's any high spots. But once again, in a quick glance, within, within five minutes of pre-chilling or pre-warming the system, we could see that everything's operating the way we designed it to do. What we also like to do is kind of go through with, uh, this is a FLIR camera, so it's thermal imaging. I can go underneath the car after we've preheated everything and kind of check to make sure there's no abnormal hot spots. We actually found a leak this way the other day too is one part was getting a little bit warmer. I'm like, what, what, what is this warm spot from? Oh, it's leaking. Um, so now as you can see, there's a pump right there. That's obviously a warm spot because the pump has been running. We have a hot spot up here where the radiator was. We applied some heat to the entire cooling system to make sure that all the thermal stuff is working correctly. But if you have one of these cameras, it's really fun to kind of go through and see where things are, are getting warm and heat saturations. Just another tool in our arsenal to make sure things are working correctly. So this build has been a really, really good proof of concept for a lot of the devices and components that we've been developing over the years to match up with that Revolt motor. Now, every package that you buy comes with a T2C controller and that's actually gonna interface the Tesla motor with actually a Bluetooth app that comes on an iPad where you can dial all of your settings and everything and that has its own CAN bus network. So we developed a wiring harness that is plug and play. This connects to your large drive unit, the Revolt motor, and this connects to your T2C. They join for power and communications and then all the peripherals come out from this. Standard 16 foot length for all of the looms. And uh, yeah, everything is clearly labeled. And this wiring harness led us to think, okay, 
a PDU contactor box would be good as well. Um, we started to think of one, started to conceptualize it, and we thought, well, before we go developing and spending money on that, let's see what products come out on the market. We got our hands on some, and some were a bit lacking, others just needed more into them. So we pulled the trigger on developing our own. So once we knew what we wanted out of our own PDU box, we went ahead and got to designing it and did our best to future-proof it as well. So it's actually in the car right here next to me, but what's inside of that is all of your contactors, fuses, relays for pre-charge, high voltage accessories, and your main pack. It also has its own current sensor in here, CAN-based of course. So as you can see, when it's actually implemented in here, it has some 90 degree two watt uh, connectors right here. Those are handling all of your main high voltage uh, battery input and then your inverter output. Uh, these have strain relief on here, which is really, really nice. And this is mounted upside down, but it can also be mounted up against a firewall, nice dressing cable to it. And we really wanted to future proof anybody that would put maybe some of the creature comforts in it as well. So. Right here we have a couple of charger inputs and a DC-DC output, and you have three accessories, all fused for 15 amps out of the box. You can change those if you want, but everything is gauged and dressed up in here really, really nicely. So the main reason we wanted to make our own is we needed it buff enough to handle the demands of not only the Revolt motor, but a lot of the creature comforts and the variety of controls that are provided from either your battery management system or analog inputs from say like your cabin to turn on your AC or your uh, cabin heater. So when we did our low voltage plug here, we wanted to make sure that you had both high and low coil control. So uh, a BMS is gonna throw probably a pull to ground, whereas some of your cabins, your cabin controls are gonna be a pull up or a, a positive 12 volt switch. So a lot of thought went into this to make sure that no matter what you throw at this, it's not gonna limit you. So when you buy a Revolt motor, it comes standard with your wiring harness, but if you also purchase this PDU contactor box separately, this is everything you need to plug and play and get a powertrain running in your build. All right, so we've had this car for a while. Uh, we've done more work to it than we ever really thought we were gonna, um, which in a lot of ways is a lot of fun because we've got a lot of development in. I think there's a name for that, it's uh, Scope Creep. Scope Creep. You know what that is? <laughs> What? It can be a positive thing. Yeah, um, it's it's the nature of this build, though. Yeah. Uh, this has been underway for quite a while. Um, technologies have changed, practices have changed, and a lot more things are available now. Yeah, and we also time. stepped up the voltage of the build. It went from a 144 volt system to a 400 volt. Yep. So things are going to evolve, and things are going to be added and need to be addressed. So yeah. I think you guys did a really good job uh, of doing that. So, so I guess we'll uh, we'll make our way around the car and kind of show you what what we've been doing this whole time. Yep. Yeah, we got so the contact. Start with that. Yeah. That's done. That's good, we know what's in there. Uh, what's what's right about that here? That is? Uh, that is inverter pump and charger pump. So obviously the cooling system in one of these cars is totally different to a gas car. You're gonna have to run you know, electric pumps. Uh, so that's those and we'll see the battery pump later on. Okay, so you say onboard charger pump turns on during charging obviously. Yes, it does. And then when you key on, your inverter pump's gonna yes. run. So yeah. this will stay off until maybe the DC-DC and onboard charger. If you're charger running gets... a bunch of light bars and stuff, yeah, yeah it would kick okay. on when you're driving, but otherwise it's the charging, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Uh, so we got a lot of send cut send stuff in this car. We talk about them a lot, but we really love their stuff. So <coughs> great example is, is that mount right there for this. And we'll see a bunch of other send cut send parts as we move through the car. The motor mounts and transmission mount, I think we talked about before how Al like used Bodhi design language for these. I, I think it's genius. I think he's an artist. Uh, big giant beefy transmission cross member is going nowhere. Uh, <laughs> this is that pump we talked about that feeds the charger, the uh, the battery radiator and the battery fan. Obviously this is driven by the PDU, so when the batteries get hot, it'll crank the fan on, but it's running the coolant the whole time anyway, just to keep them all at the same, I mean, same that, kind of temperature. That speaks to how well those batteries are thermally managed. The fact that you can have that small of a format of a radiator yeah. fan, yeah. and it'll still probably maintain that window of optimal temperature. Oh yeah, the radiator kicks out so much heat. Yeah. Those little seat traps are, are awesome. Yeah. Um, so I guess we'll pretty much follow the cooling lines back. So all of this runs, you know, pressure side on the one side and return on the other. And at the back, you got the manifolds that spiderweb all that out to the uh, to the batteries. Let's go take a look at that. I gotta say, start on a tight shot here. Or... This is really cool. How I mean, I mean, this is one of the lowest parts of the of the car, right? Pretty much is. So this is car, the, yeah. yeah, this is the driver's seat and passenger seat battery boxes. Then you got your 12 volt battery box, and just these lines are running right along it, which is key because this being your pressure line needs to be one of the lower points. Yeah. So you got your charge and inverter pump and then your battery pumps right here. 
yep. starting low. You'll see some stuff in number. some odd locations. Yeah, like the, the reservoir, we'll get into it in the interior of the car, but it's in an odd spot kind of on the package tray because that's the highest point that we could mount it. You need yeah. your reservoir high and you need your battery yeah. as low as you can reasonably get it. That, that, that air's gotta get out somehow, right? Yeah. So, and, and this being a classic car, normally you have so much room in a classic car because the chassis are huge. Mm. Uh, these are Not classic that. classics where it's before everybody started making those big passenger vehicles. This People were like, smaller back very then. Very small, yeah. <laughs> they were my size back then. So, uh, it, it did a lot with the room that you guys had, mm. so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can see, following these lines in, the manifolds here, we got these uh, five-way, they split to six different battery boxes spiderwebs out and then the low pressure side comes back to another manifold and back to the pump. So, so this big trunk hose in, big trunk hose in, smaller hoses out to each of your module yeah. manifolds coming back in and then going back to that bigger so bigger size hose up to the yeah. So the, the amount of connection points you got in this, there's a huge potential for, for leaks. So part of what we did when we got the car in, uh, this is what connected to the three battery modules. I'm not a huge fan of this. So you'd have Pressure, pressure, and pressure for three batteries, and then another one of these, return, return, and return. And you can see how many potential spots you got here for leaks. So we just weren't willing to put that in the battery box. So what we had instead was these made up. Obviously these, one missing off of this one. Uh, you just reduce your, your risk of leak by so far. These are really, really nice pieces. We got them from uh, Felton in the UK. So these look like they're perfectly spaced for the cooling input and output uh, they are. nipples from yeah, the yeah. back of the Tesla models. <laughs> <laughs> it is a bit nipply out. I mean nippy out. <laughs> what am I saying, nipple? <laughs> so, okay, so that makes sense. So you have three and three, and they kind of interlock almost, yep. and then you can kind of, yeah, that's where these yeah. hoses are connecting to with another AN fitting. There you go, yeah. Cool. So fewer connections, fewer points of leak. You cut it down by bite. Oh, three dude. quarters. Looking at that, it, yeah. <laughs> it's gotta be 25% of the connections that could possibly leak. So I see this thing right here. It's coming back from our Revo motor and it is carbon fiber. Uh, what brand and that what are the benefits? Mark Williams driveline. Uh, big benefit of that is it's so light and so balanced that if you had an out of balance drive shaft in a gas car, you may not have noticed because you've got the gas motor running. There's a bunch of vibration in the car mm -hmm. already. But if you've got yeah. anything in an electric car, it's gonna show up much more. So we use the same thing in, in the docks. You probably look a little quieter if you're doing it. Like, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool. Um, they weigh nothing. You, you pick them up like in one hand like it's nothing. Nice. I think we're pretty much at the back bumper and that takes us to our safety disconnect right at the back. Obviously, it's a pretty important piece of the car. Uh, you don't want to hide it away somewhere. So you want it somewhere that's not right in your face, but somewhere that, let's say you were going all across and you can put a little arrow right here, safety switch, and someone can find it in a hurry. Uh, I guess we'll start back up again in the trunk. We'll bring the car down and we'll look at all this stuff. Okay, something we uh, didn't expect to be working on when we got this car in was the battery boxes. So it had battery boxes in it, but with the extra power that we've added, we just weren't happy that they were gonna stay put <laughs> under acceleration. So Will yeah. put together this design for us with they, a they, really nice feature here. Yeah, they needed a, a bit of steroids. They needed to be buffed up. So uh, we're still working with, uh, 5052 aluminum, but rather than just being strips along these alignment and mounting bars of the batteries, it's a full plate. Mm. Okay? And uh, we've notched it out for those bars. And these, all of these aluminum panels kind of uh, puzzle piece into each other. They're dovetailed into each other. And, yeah, or jigsawed this, into this each other. This one, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So and even without the bolt, it's, it's yeah. strong. Yep, but then also this bracket does a couple of different things. It holds this top plate, and this top plate comes off so that you can actually put these batteries in. So this bracket is holding that as well as holding to the body. And then we also have a, through, a couple of uh, through bolts to the deck as well as to the firewall. Gotcha. And that kind of, there's probably not two of these that are the same in the car, right? They're all slightly different. Uh, so this one and the one behind it are the same as okay. well as the package in front. Okay. Then the ones under the seats are a little bit different. And then this one right here, actually, I believe Bodhi did before it came. Yes, this, because this one we, we told him to add a battery. Yeah. So, yeah. so this is something that Underestimated at your peril, battery boxes are gonna take you a good <laughs> amount of time when you're doing a uh, doing yeah. an EV conversion. It's kind of one of the things people overlook a lot of the time. So uh, of course we use our buddy Senko Sen for oh, yeah. all of this as well. So they do obviously the water jetting, they do the bending and the powder coating now. So yeah. this was out of the box. Thread inserts now. They yes. were drilled tapped. and hardware inserts. This whole plate was from them. Yeah. All of these holes came tapped. They'll do hardware inserts they, like they you they say. Do the 
both the studs and everything. Yeah. Pretty soon, Excellent. I think you're gonna be able to order a whole car from them, like running. <laughs> it's pretty amazing, you know, gig they got going there. Yep. Uh, but that does bring us to the plane, the whole AEM suite that we have here. You can see blinking away. This all looks familiar too. Is this in the dock? This is exactly the same as in the dock, minus the PDU. So on this one, we moved the PDU to the rear because it interfaced with more stuff in the area of the car. It was just a nicer spot for it. Yeah. Um, I guess to kind of give you a rundown from the outside, it's all, you know, kind of blinky lights, all hand wavy, but it's fairly simple once you break it down. So the VCU is the brains of the operation. The big thing that it's doing is managing batteries. So yeah. this is talking to every one of these that you see in the car and it's listening for cell voltages, cell temperature, whatever it is. Let's say the battery voltage, battery uh, temperature is getting a little high. This talks to the PDU and tells it, hey, turn that, turn that fan on that we were talking about earlier. And it will send voltage down that wire to the fan, cool it down. So it really is not as, you know, brainiac as it sounds. It's, it's pretty simple. It's not as complex as it is. Yeah, 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 yeah. So what does what each of these modules handle? Does it handle like a three each or four of these? One does, yeah, one, it's worked out really nicely for us. Each one of these does 18 cells and each one of these boxes of the three is 18 cells. Yeah, because these are all six cell yeah. series. Nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is the CCU, right? So that's your yeah. onboard charger as well as your DC-DC or alternator. Uh, it, since we're lacking an alternator, this yeah. acts, right? So that's charging from the 400 volt pack that's stepping down to the 12 volt or 13.8 and charging the battery so that you don't lose your lights and, and then all your bells and whistles, right? Cool. So where does, where's the charging outlet on this thing? Charging outlet is on the opposite corner. The charger is going to be behind the driver's side headlight bucket. So I see this is the only component back here besides the batteries that has cooling to it. It so. does, yeah. There's a good amount of current going through this. It is doing the job of like a 150 amp alternator. Uh, so you do need active cooling to it. Plus the charger side. On the batteries though, you can see these little 5 16 lines uh, running our dielectric coolant through them. Uh, so we've done everything we can to mitigate leaks, but even if, who knows, some kid walks up with a pair of scissors and cuts one of those lines, it, it's basically baby oil. You could submerge this whole car in the stuff and it's not gonna, you know, damage anything. Baby oil that isn't gonna transfer the electricity and isn't gonna cause corrosion. Yeah, yeah no corrosion on those babies. <laughs> no corrosion, oh, oh, oh. Will it evaporate over time? I don't even think it evaporates. <laughs> oh, so it'll be Aaron. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. cool. <laughs> nice. That's a good find because normally these things run with G48 and G48. Salty. Just all those things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Causes corrosion, transfers the electricity, and is just no good for any of the plastics or metals no. in the in the modules. No. And I think you're gonna see a sneak peek here, these little 3D printed brackets. Ooh. Eddie B has a new toy. <laughs> and he's been making these his baby beautiful little resin 3D prints. Uh, so a lot of the stuff you're gonna see is gonna be much stronger. We can do a lot more with the. Uh, 3D printed parts we used to be able to do. We have a new capability. Nice. We're pretty wrapped up on the outside of the car. Uh, and we're pretty wrapped up on the inside too. So we're waiting for one light for Will's beautiful speed hut gauge cluster before that can go in. Uh, we're just waiting on a mount to be designed for our AEM-2. This is gonna be nice and hidden away. So the customer wanted uh, analog gauges. And I, I totally agree for an old car like this, having a digital dash would take me out of it personally. So he wanted this in, in the glove compartment, which I think is perfect. This will let you look at every single battery cell, um, temperature, voltage, your current, all the information you could possibly want is on this. This talks to the AEM system and it talks to the T2C. Uh, that's kind of the instrumentation. As far as making the thing run, we have our neutral reverse and drive switches here. I'll try and demonstrate those. So the brake switch is mounted. I'll have to talk over some <laughs> noises, uh, but the brake switch is mounted here on this 3D printed bracket to the brake pedal, and it won't select drive or reverse or any of that until you hit the brakes. And then you can get into drive, you know, neutral, reverse. So that's nice. You can see two more of uh, Will's beautiful ruggedized battery boxes here, and you can see some of the cooling we had to get in the back of these. This, I got the smallest hands, so this was my job, getting all down in here and latching these on, but now that it's done, this is so, so sorted. Um, 
behind you, Danny. I don't know if you're gonna be able to point the camera at it, but that's where the reservoir is that I was talking about for the uh, the battery cooling. It's at the, it sits at the highest point that we could possibly mount it. It was a pain to get it like that, but it had to be like that. It was the right way to do it, so that's the way that it is. Uh, what else do we have in here? There's a lot of little stuff in a car like this that just adds up and adds up. So for one, that was a bigger job than we thought it was gonna be was get the Tesla throttle pedal in here. Uh, so we like to use a Tesla throttle pedal because we know that it works with our controller and we know it's robust, but that had to get mounted on the bulkhead and that was a, a big job, big job. It was a size of more of a job than we thought because there's a battery on the other side of this. So you can't just go putting bolt heads and stuff back there. Little stuff like that. There's a fireman's loop. So this is gonna be somewhere very accessible on this side of the dashboard. So it's a requirement for the legacy EV compliance. And I think it's also just a good idea that if you cut this, it's a 12 volt line. There's no dangerous voltage here. This kills the whole car. This kills every contactor dead. Uh, then there's little stuff like this. This is a regen disable switch. I don't think they're gonna be using this, uh, which is why I didn't hook it up to anything, but it's there if they want it. If you're gonna go racing or autocrossing, you have the option to turn regen braking off completely. It makes the car more predictable. It, it, imagine a car with no engine braking. Just like in the rear, we have two of these BMSs, one here and one here, each responsible for the 18 cells in each of these battery boxes. I was put in charge of wiring harness colors for this, so you know they're Welsh flag colors, they gotta be. Just the same as Eddie B's is, is red, white, and blue. <laughs> so I think that pretty much wraps it up for the major stuff. I'm sure there's a thousand things I'm forgetting uh, that I'm gonna kick myself for when we stop rolling, but that pretty much covers the, the, the large stuff. So I hope that gives you a better overview of what, what it takes, what it takes to have a build at this level. We're done with the Vic. It's gonna go up to hot dogs, some uh, final touches on the motor paint. Um, when we wiggled it in there, we, we put some scratches on it. So that's gonna get fixed up by hot dog. Car's done. Um, we've tested everything, we've driven it, done all the thermal management on it, programmed everything. Uh, it's time for Bodie to take this car over again, do all the final fit and finish. So Bodie Stroud is gonna go ahead and go through the whole vehicle, put all the panels back on, basically put Humpty Dumpty back together again, put his final touches on it, and we hope to see this thing rolling down the street very soon with Tim Allen inside of it, with a big smile on his face, torching tires, and maybe debut it at SEMA this year, 2024. We'll catch you guys later. Check out more on this build coming soon. We'll show it on the street, tearing up some tires.